I am recording. Oh, sorry. It says recording. Excuse <laughs> me. Uh, Long enough to blind someone. <laughs> Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode next one of Nights at the Round Table. I forgot the numbers. I'm really sorry, guys. <laughs> uh, today we are discussing the book Dragon's, Dragon's Egg. Egg. Uh, by uh, Robert Ro Forward. <laughs> <laughs> Have a drink of coffee. <laughs> Maybe we, no, I'm not even going to bother with a take two. That's Dragon's Egg by Robert L. Forward. And since there's just the two of us today, Eric's going to start off with general impressions. I almost called you Edward. Edward. Oh my. I don't sparkle. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> uh, all right. Dragon's Egg, when I first read it, was a huge shock because I was expecting a fantasy. I had sat down, I had been reading Asimov and a whole bunch of other hard sci-fi and decided, I'll read a fantasy. So I picked up the book from the library, <laughs> opened it, and went, oh, this is cool. It's definitely hard sci-fi, even like hard soft sci-fi. There's like, a lot of soft in there. There's yeah. a lot of sociology, psychology, anthropology, and yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't know how authentic the science is, but it felt good from reading. Um, I had completely forgotten, because I read it first in high school, and just now, just now, I was... Uh, I had forgotten the humans, completely. The humans, to me, were totally boring. Even in this one, they were sort of meh. It was really the chila, the little high-gravity aliens that I loved. Mm -hmm. I described it as sort of watching a game of civilizations yeah. for an alien. Yeah, uh, agreed. Uh, when I when we first pulled this out of the bowl and it said Dragon's Egg, I'm like, oh, fantasy, yay, this is my stuff. Turns out, science fiction. Um, and it's a really good book. It's a really, really good read. There is a lot of hard science in there, which can, you know, make some people afraid of the book, but don't be, because I am not a scientist, and I followed everything just fine. Yeah, I like that he doesn't go chapters. Like, yeah. in some other science fiction books, you will go a whole chapter with technical details. Mm -hmm. And for a book that is now 30, at least, years old, maybe 40... I think it was written in the will 70s or 80s. Put up an annotation as to the publication date of yeah. this book. Yeah. It doesn't do well for a big chapter. But little bits of science all the way through felt completely logical. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, because I am an anthropology geek, the uh, the development of the chila from, uh, from plants to animals to becoming self aware and intelligent was incredibly fascinating. And I loved how much. Uh, the development of the chila paralleled the development of Western civilization. Specifically Western civilization, but you can't blame the author for that really. I mean, his last name is Forward. So, Saxon. Very Saxon. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so, yeah. Uh, but it was, it was great. I really enjoyed this book. It was simply written, really easy to understand, and the development of the chila were absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. Really interesting watch. I loved the life cycle of the Chila. The turns? Yeah. The, basically, it's 15 minutes. They live for 15 minutes, but that's an entire lifetime mm -hmm. for them. They experience time faster. Yeah. Uh, and than the, humans. <laughs> I like the, the eggs and how once you get to a certain age, your job is taking care of the babies. Yeah. I thought that, that was actually, cool. That's very that, cute, right? It parallels human society, yeah, right? Yeah, to a certain extent. To a certain extent, except for uh, most of human development, it was the elderly women mm -hmm. who would... Yeah, the men and women in this were very equal. Mm -hmm. And most, I think I remember mentioning, or remembering it being mentioned, that most of the troopers were female. Uh, one of the troops, or two of the troops, they'd like to interchange them after a while, so that they wouldn't get bored. Yeah. Because yeah. they also had no qualms with sex at all. No, none at all. None of the weird taboos that we have. No. It, it's not a criticism of the book as much as a... it. Again, very Western civilization, so it makes sense that it was very Western ideology-ish. Mm -hmm. There were two sexes, male and female. Female carried the egg. It was very binary. 
Like, yeah. Which makes sense for the time it was written and for his background, but it would have been cool to play around with that, because there yeah. was a lot of authors playing around with that at that time. Yeah, the, playing around with gender would have been interesting, and also having mm -hmm. intersex yeah. would have been interesting, sort of more on the genetic level rather than the societal, um, what are they called? Roles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I also have to give a special mention to the uh, um, author for Pierre, the character, who is main job he feels when you meet him is rectifying history because he believes that his mother's contribution to history were largely overlooked mm -hmm. which is a huge issue for women in science so I'm props to the author for bringing that up it just it was a little throwaway line but that made me stop and go oh yes thank you but he also yes. brought it up a lot during her interactions with her superiors yeah, like he would, took credit more than he would with a male researcher. Oh yes, and, yeah. So he yeah. was the one who got to go on all the interviews, etc. And she was just sort of shuffled down as a footnote, yeah. even though the discovery was hers. So, yeah, thanks for that, Mr. Forward. Mm -hmm. Appreciate Very it. Forward thinking. Don't Sorry, make me spill this on this. you. <laughs> Don't waste coffee. <laughs> it's good coffee. Mm -hmm. Thanks, generic. Yay. <laughs> I also really like the Pink Eyes Jesus allegory. Yes, that was interesting. And it was very much written by a scientist. Yeah. You could tell <laughs> right off the bat, this was not Jesus written by a person of deep faith. <laughs> the guy, they worshipped a sun, and he could see a special light spectrum. Yeah, the special light spectrum, though, was de deliberately... Uh, the scanning of the, the, yeah, the pulsar star, the neutron star. Scan laser scanning. I laser think. scanning, yeah. Um, that they, the Chila believed was a gift from God, was actually scientific, human scientific inquiry on this, the surface of this pulsar. And the Pink Eyes, uh, who later became God Chosen, he did everything pretty much that Jesus did, all the main things. Mm -hmm. He left society behind and went into the wilderness for a long time in Chila. It was seconds, but it was a long time for the Chila. Um, discovered God, communed with God, came back and started preaching, grabbed a massive number of followers. He overturned the tables at the temple, like Jesus did with the merchants. Yeah, I, yeah, I read that, but I was like, hey. <laughs> yeah. uh, and in the end was crucified by a rabid crowd. It wasn't exactly a crucifixion, but close enough. Yeah. yeah. Um, I like that every piece of the story was relevant to another. So it built on itself. Him seeing the lasers meant that later on they knew that that genetic... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not a defect, a genetic difference. meant they could see the lasers, which yeah. let them talk to the humans who were... Yeah. So everything right built so on everything else. Yeah. Yes. So well done. Because I can was. imagine where it could be self-indulgent to write little pieces that are cool but have nothing to do with the overall arc. But uh, yeah, but ev that. everything in this book was necessary to mm -hmm. the book, which is nice. You don't. Which sometimes. is good considering it's only three hundred pages. Two hundred and something pages for a hard sci-fi. It's pretty small. It is. It's a. I I forgot to bring it. So we don't have it as an example, but it's not a very thick book at all, so it's not, it doesn't feel intimidating when you crack no. it open. It took me uh, two weeks to read, and I read slowly. It took me four hours. <laughs> <laughs> not two weeks straight. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Eric, why are you doing work? Shh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I read this all yesterday. From start to finish. No, I woke up yesterday morning, I'm like, oh crap! <laughs> I need to read this book! It's a good thing it wasn't boring. Yeah, right? Or very, very thick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also, I'm gonna go on and on about the things that I really like, but self-referential self science fiction is self-referential and it made me so happy. Like when they first made contact with the Chila, mm -hmm. and Pierre's look uh, is getting people to research how to make contact with intelligent alien species and he says uh, look in the fiction Holloman for science fiction stories if you have to and that made me laugh mm -hmm. because a lot of 
the scientific advancement that we see was first conceptualized by scientific writers, uh, science fiction writers. Mm -hmm. um, so it made me really, really happy to see that written down, and I was like, hey, hey. I wonder if Mr. Forward wrote it down, and I was like, hey. Probably. <laughs> because did, I know I would have been. Did you notice the end notes? Oh my god, yes, I love the end all, notes. All the last names were science fiction authors. Uh, yes, uh, including his own name twice. He mm -hmm. referenced himself. Apparently, he in the year 2050-something, yeah. he wrote a paper <laughs> that he then referenced in order to write the rest of his book. That takes dedication to write a fake science book paper reference for your science fiction book. Right? It, I loved the really end notes. Cool. It yeah. made me laugh. As a because, you know, as an academic speak, whenever I read a paper, um, I'll also go out and I'll read the references that I found to be most interesting to the discussion that they list in the footnotes or end notes. And so that he listed the end notes made my little academic heart go, Wee this is hilarious. Did you read um the uh, appendix appendix that was listed as um, from Del Rey, published by Random House Interplanetary. <laughs> yes. That also made me giggle. Mm -hmm. It's nice to see something that is so steeped in social sciences and sciences still to not take itself too seriously. Yeah, yeah. It was big little mm -hmm. nudges, grinning nudges at the end of the book that made me really, really, really happy. And yeah, I'm really glad this was pulled out of the bowl. It's a good book. I really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. Some things did bother me. Okay. Mostly to do with the hominids, <laughs> right at the start of the book, um, and then the explanation for um, anatomically human, evolu uh, yeah. human evolution. Yeah, which was very sort of glanced over. Which you know I don't blame them because there wasn't an awful lot of information back then. Um, but you know, a lot of the things that we attribute to atomically modern humans happened well before atomically modern humans were even thought of, <laughs> culturally speaking. So, yeah. Yeah. But there is that one point, I think um, Robert Sawyer talks about it in Hominids and other things, where it's almost as if Neanderthals and... What were we at that point? And were we Rectus, though? Or were we further back? But the, where there were two species at the same time. Oh, that and, happened a lot, actually. Okay, and one of them sort of got that extra spark. So, I think that's what he was going for in this, Robert Ford, was well, saying that, that that boom sort of affected one genetically uh, to speed up evolution. Evolution or, or something? Uh, I was a communications major. Yes! <laughs> I love science, but uh, this is way beyond me. Yeah, anthropology, uh, prehistoric anthropology specifically, is one of my first loves. But uh, in there was Homo erectus, anatomically modern humans, and Homo neanderthalensis all existing around the same time. Homo okay. erectus was largely in Asia, um, okay. and Neanderthal was largely, at that time, where it was cold, so Western and Northern Europe. So, mm. yeah. And then anatomically modern humans came along and went... Screw you guys! <laughs> We're taking everything! Yeah. We're a great species. Okay, so yeah, my my biggest problem was with the the treatment of archaic hominids and the arrival of anatomically modern humans. But that's a small thing, and it's excusable, because it was quite a while ago, and they didn't know half as much about human development then as we do now. And I will say that every time we discover something about human development, the threshold for when something was discovered and utilized keeps getting pushed back. So language was first utilized. That's been pushed back by a number of thousands of years. The, the first tools been pushed back by a number of hundreds of thousands of years. So <laughs> it's excusable, is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. That's my point. <laughs> okay. I have a point. I'm trying to think of any problems I had. I didn't really have many. I mean, I, f I found the humans kind of boring, but they weren't that big. Yeah, they weren't really the main characters no. in the story, even. Um, it but was... I like how, at one point, the humans are mentioning how emotional it is that every 15 minutes they have to 
watch a friend who they're talking to, the Chila, die, mm -hmm. and they mention how hard it is, because that mimics the earlier parts of the book where you go through learning about a character, seeing their life story, and then they die. Yeah. And you know they're dead because it's hun hundreds of turns, Chila years. So it, 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 that was kind of cool. Yeah, it was, it was cool. I liked how the humans were actors but not protagonists in the story. Mm -hmm. All of the protagonists were aliens, which was awesome. And I also loved how human meddling is what started the whole Chila massive empire civilization thing. Mm -hmm where it starts off as just a bunch of Chila trying to survive, and then a bunch of Chila finding religion, and then a bunch of Chila abandoning religion for science, and then in the end, because their lifespans are so short, uh, Robert Ford treated their acquisition of knowledge the way viruses would expand. Okay. Viruses change and expand. Because they, they, their lifespans of the organisms are relatively short, the chance of mutation becoming something else, so evolution happens much more rapidly for smaller organisms with shorter lifespans than it does for people like, for people, yeah. for organisms like us who live maybe about 80 years, right? Change happens much faster. Because change happens much faster, knowledge acquisition for these creatures happens much faster, so that by the end of the book, they're spoiler so alert, they've, far beyond they're humans. so far surpassed human beings that they've left clues to their knowledge in an upload to the human beings, which involves a pyramid on another planet. <laughs> yeah. We put a pyramid on this planet with yeah. uh, how to get yeah. light, uh, faster than light travel. If you want to decrypt this information that we've given you, de-encrypt this information that we've given to you, you have to be advanced enough to travel to this other planet and find this pyramid. How so very Prometheus. <laughs> I haven't watched that. Oh god, the end yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard terrible things. Um, I do like that, and I like that it was... They put it there to help humans, in that we might come to the wrong conclusion, but still be able to solve the solution. That mm -hmm. happened to me in high school all the time. I would have the wrong answer, but I did it right. And then they, their knowledge would correct us, or help us. Mm -hmm. And the idea was that eventually humans would reach the same point and be able to find the Chila and then do another exchange. Or that there's a, a finite number of facts in the universe, yeah. so eventually humankind will reach Chila level of intelligence. That was a little um, arrogant, but I mean, well, any su you be arrogant sufficiently you... advanced civilization. Right? I mean, even the Chila were arrogant throughout. By calling every other tribe barbarians mm -hmm. and and so on. Well, and, so and forth. it stems from how they developed, right? So yeah. Who is the leader of this clan is the traditional challenge for leadership, mm -hmm. which it was very effective for them. Mm -hmm. It worked. I like how at one point they worshipped humans so much that they tried to emulate uh, Napoleon. <laughs> Of all humans, I know. I'm like, and they really? mentioned, no. And, and they mentioned because one of the one of the Chila mentioned that they wanted to go through the history of Napoleon because it must be at least as interesting as Machiavelli. Oh my god! Uh, didn't end well for those Chila. <laughs> well, actually, it ended very French. Yeah, yeah, and they so they start giving. I like the change in names too. This small mm -hmm. level of detail. The Chila are given names that you might think are relatively primitive. So there's. Um, one of the early ones. Can't even remember. The only one I'm thinking of is Swift Killer. Swift Killer, yeah. Yeah. Who got her name because she killed a lot of these creatures called Swifts, right? And um, and then as they progress, they start incorporating human names. So they meet a Leonardo. Yeah. <laughs> one of the two becomes Leonardo, and then they advance even more. And then the names are all scientific, like oh, what was that? The guy who invented the. The Antigrav. The Antigrav. Uh, what was his name? Superfluid. Superfluid, yes. Yeah, so they ended up with names like Superfluid. And they even uh, discussed the fact that for a while they were calling it Superfluid's Theorem. Yeah. And he's like, no, 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 don't, no, 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 because no. you're going to confuse people. Think of the poor students yeah. who, this has nothing to do with Superfluid. I just had... <laughs> Superfluids, yeah. Someone it's who called me. It's just my name, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just yeah. the name they gave me when I was a hatchling. Yeah. 
And I like that in that one, they had to create anti-gravity in order to decompress carbon matter into a diamond. That got me confused. Because aren't diamonds created by increased heat and pressure? I uh, yes. But I think it's a structured... Like, it's a structure of carbon. Right. And because the neutron star was so heavy, it crushed it even further in. Oh. That's what I got out of it. It was so crushed that their but gravity even... had to lessen in order to be even close to the close shape to... of it. I'm... Okay, okay. So that makes sense. Now, thank you for that. Because yeah, I read no that and I'm like, wait a minute. Okay, yeah, that does make sense. Oh, yeah. And oh. then they named Sparkling Crystal or whatever. It was. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or the, um, the, the, ti the... At one point they go visit the humans. And <laughs> there's one that is just... They carry a black hole to create the gravity so that they don't explode. Yeah. And it's enough that the guy feels it on his nose when he's close to the window. Yeah, like his nose is being pulled, pulled. through the window at something like 3 Gs or something. And yeah. here's the thing, when he sees the Chila, it's a little spaceship, no bigger than a mustard seed. And that idea made me incredibly happy for some reason. I'm like, that... It's actually kind of adorable. And the Chila had to spend the equivalent of what, like a year or three weeks in his ship not moving so the human could s register him. Yeah, because otherwise it would all be over too soon. And yeah. yeah, That was so cool. It was cool. The way they handled the difference in time mm -hmm. was really cool. And I like that he brought up the medical ethics. In the same trip, they discovered that, because they see in x-rays, they discovered that one of the women had breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, well, we can't do anything without her permission. That wouldn't be right. And the others are like, but we have to. We're not here for very long. And by the time she gets home, it'll be too late. Yeah. So they make the decision for her. And I'm like, I see. That's awkward. But if it was me, I'd be really happy. Yeah. Well, I don't think she ever finds out, right? No, it's she's not like, like they send her a fax later, like, by the way, you had cancer, but we took care of that. It, pretty much all she knows is she got a, ow! Yeah. And that's it. And, that was and it. a little bit of, like, a sunburn mark. Yeah. Because, you know, high voltage x rays. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I always thought that was cool. That was the one thing I remembered of the humans when I first read it. Oh, I was like, yeah? Whoa. So what number of reading is this for you? Second. Second? Second. Okay, so this is my first. I don't yeah. have any nostalgia attached to it, so you can... I have nostalgia, but I read so much science fiction back then that there's some that was really bad. Mm -hmm. This always stuck with me because I love watching the development. I mean, I wouldn't study it, but I love seeing it. Oh, God, like studying a, a it movie is so would be wonderful. Fun. This would be an amazing movie if they could do it. That, actually, yeah. And there's a sequel, too, which I haven't read, but it's called Starquake. And apparently there's a giant earthquake, full planet quake for the Chila. And it's them surviving that. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, cool bananas. I think yeah. we, we might need to put that in the bowl. Because I would mm -hmm. like to read more. Because it's actually pretty awesome. Like, this book is really, really cool. Do you have any major complaints? The only one I had was I would have liked to see non-binary or something different sex-wise. Okay. I like that he played around with the gender roles. But other than that, um, I mean, the love story at the beginning was a little lame. Between oh, the humans, yeah, Dan and yeah, it was, nice. but it wasn't an important story other to to give us Piaf. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I like that one of the scientists. That this is probably one of the things that may have pushed it back home. What he did is he wrote children's books and explanation books because a scientist even back then couldn't live on their work. <laughs> yeah, and exactly. actually be big. Yeah. And he had developed quite a following. Yeah, yeah, it made me think very much of um, Neil deGrasse Tyson and how he is the face of, and he explains things to people, mm -hmm. where theoretical physicists and theoretical astrophysicists, it's hard to understand what they're talking about. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I also like that he was yeah. an author. And I also like that he had a hefty uh, royalty package waiting for him yeah. when he got back. I was like, God damn it. Well, at least you do. <laughs> well, every <laughs> author has to put that in a book for hope. <laughs> for hope. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, there isn't an awful lot that I didn't like about this book. And again, you know, issues with human development aside, I loved the Chila so much. I loved that 
they could revert back to their plant um, mm -hmm. forms in cases of extreme stress and then regenerate back into their animal forms. That is I, so cool. Right? I love how they move. They don't walk, they flow. Because yeah. the gravity is so great on this uh, pulsar slash neutron star that they can't rise up above the crust. So they literally just flow so along like it. they're like little puddles with eye stalks yeah. that they can make. The, yeah. I, I like that they can build their own bones. Yeah, they can build their own skeletons. That was super cool. It was really, really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. So, great job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, final thoughts before we go on to star rating? It's nice to read a book that is nostalgic, that is as good as you remember. <laughs> it doesn't happen very yes. often. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I'm very happy, very pleased. Yeah, um, I really enjoyed this book. I'm really happy it was in the bowl. If it's still in print, I want a copy from my own library. So, yeah, good book. Star rating? Uh, 4.5. Uh, four for me. So yeah, great book then. <laughs> Pick the next one, you. Ooh, yay. Come on. Oh, this one's stuck in my fingers. The Dark Lord's Handbook by Paul Dale. I don't know anything about this book. Me neither. Sounds like the uh, Evil Overlord list. Yeah, right? The Dark Lord's Handbook by Paul Dale. I, th I have a sneaking suspicion that this might be a comedy. I hope so. <laughs> With that title, it's either really cheesy fantasy or a comedy. Or a comedy, yeah. Or both. Or both. Which, you know, yeah. often is. So, in two weeks' time, we will be... Uh, talking about? Yep. Yeah, talking about The Dark Lord's Handbook. I need more coffee. Uh, if you have any books that you would like us to read, do leave them in a comment down below. Uh, if you have read any of the books that we have already reviewed, we have a Goodreads book club where you can discuss them at your leisure. And don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks very much. Bye! And the end. <laughs>